The 60s was a time of turmoil across North America. Society's values were being challenged. Materialism was out, idealism was in, and racism was not about to disappear. Reuben Hurricane Carter was a victim of that racism, a young black American boxer who ended up framed for murder. Hurricane might have spent his entire life in prison, except for an idealistic band of Canadians who decided to drop everything to take up Carter's cause. It changed their lives, the future of a young ghetto boy, and most of all, it turned around the life of Reuben Hurricane Carter. Griffith wobbles as he gets to his knees to listen to the count. In the boxing ring, he was ferocious. Carter moves in to finish it. He was also an outspoken champion in the fight for civil rights during the 60s. Reuben Hurricane Carter was a contender. In 1963, at Madison Square Gardens, he knocked out Emil Griffiths in one round. Carter was going to be the next middleweight boxing champion of the world. Leather from every direction sends Griffith down again. He would never get his shot at that title. The best thing about Carter's childhood in Patterson, New Jersey, was that he survived it. A decaying industrial town where being a poor black kid meant learning about bigotry, crime, and violence. Reuben Carter's career died on June 17, 1966. A gruesome crime took place at a rundown bar in Patterson. It became the subject of a Bob Dylan song called Hurricane. Four months after the murders, a thief, Alfred Bello, himself a suspect, placed Reuben Carter and a kid named John Artis at the scene of the crime. So with no apparent motive and on flimsy evidence, Carter and Artis were arrested for the murders at the Lafayette Grill. All of Reuben's cards were marked in advance. The trial was a big circus. He never had a chance. The judge made Reuben's witnesses. They were sentenced to three life terms. Then suddenly, seven years later, Alfred Bellow, the man who originally incriminated Carter, goes public. He says he lied at the trial, that police pressured him to finger Carter. The case became the focus of a national campaign. Bob Dylan wrote his song, Hurricane, and held a benefit concert. The famous and not so famous found a cause in Carter. Rock stars, athletes, and actresses demonstrated, protesting the injustice done to him. Carter had already served 10 years when the New Jersey Supreme Court ordered a second trial. The prosecution tried to prove the murders were racially motivated. The judge bought it and sent Artis and Carter back to the penitentiary. You spent 20 years in jail for murders you did not commit. How did you deal with that? I knew that I was innocent. I knew that I was not in prison for murder. I knew that. So my every day in prison was one of fighting against the entire prison system. That, that is every, I, I wouldn't eat his food. I wouldn't wear his clothing. I wouldn't even acknowledge the guards or the warden or anyone. I wouldn't talk to a guard, see? Therefore, the vast majority of my time was spent in solitary confinement. Here's the story of the hurricane. The man the authorities came to blame. We pick the story up in 1979 here in Bushwick, a tough section of Brooklyn in New York City. By now, Reuben Carter has been locked up for 13 years, telling court after court he is not a murderer. At the same time, here in Bushwick, a 15-year-old boy, Lesra Martin, is growing up in the midst of poverty and violence. By chance, sheer coincidence, he meets a group of Canadians from Toronto who will change the course of his life forever. And together, they will change the life of Reuben Hurricane Carter. 
That boy, Lesra Martin, is a man today. This is the first time in over 10 years he's back to Linden Street in Brooklyn and the house where he grew up. This is a place where a kid gets mugged for his milk money. The one that uh, we used to live in uh, back in 1979. It doesn't look very good. No, no, it doesn't at all. What does it mean growing up on a street like this? My father, he wasn't working. We were on welfare, and that was inadequate. Uh, so uh, I pretty much worked all day to make sure we ate that night. How is it coming back here now? Frightening. <laughs> I'm 27 years old now, and uh, I, I might still be here. No, that to me, that, that's sad. It's frightening. It's very frightening. A world away from that ghetto, in a small town north of Toronto, is the reason Lesra Martin got out of Brooklyn. A group of Canadians who have lived and worked together for 20 years. They consider themselves a family. They share everything. Yeah, that's that's it. It. That's including a desire to make the world a little better. They started living together in the early 70s. This may have been an idealistic commune, but it was a rich one, with a big house in Toronto, the money coming from their successful Yorkville batik business. In 1979, two members of that group went to New York on a business trip. At a warehouse in Brooklyn, they happened to meet Lesra Martin, who was working there for the summer. Lesra grew close to these Canadians, especially Terry Swinton and Sam Chayton. It was difficult to communicate at first using words because his language was really a different language from the language that we spoke. Um, his vocabulary was very limited. No expectations of himself, no expectations of anybody he knew, his family, friends, um, uh, no, no hopes, no, no dreams. That was a direct reflection of the environment that he grew up in. The Canadians invited Lesra up to Toronto for a visit. When he got back to New York, all he could think about were his new Canadian friends. Actually, when I first came, I called him all the time, every single day. In fact, I'm sure that phone right there has my fingerprints on it, <laughs> engraved in the receiver. Because but every day? Every single day. And every day, Lesra would go to school. He was in grade 11 and thought he was doing well but he was only reading at a grade two level. So he was 15 going into grade 11 and he was illiterate? Basically, yes, that's right. But he was incredibly bright. He was uh, unbelievably curious. He would constantly be asking questions about this or that. The Canadians wanted to help Lesra, and his parents wanted him to get a better education too. So he moved to Toronto and the Canadians began to tutor him. While Lesra was rebuilding his life, Reuben Carter was doing life in Trenton State Prison. And now, coming back here after all these years is not easy for Carter. He was a different person behind those walls. He remembers that as an innocent man, the only way he could survive was to play the role of a hardened prize fighter. You were a mean guy. You were pushing everybody away. You were pushing everybody out of your life. That's not being mean. That's having the survival instinct, the instinct to survive. But that's and how everybody read it. That's what everybody saw. I don't care what people saw. The thing that they didn't see and they couldn't have seen was trying to survive this brick and mortar and steel and hatred and anger and hostility and humiliation. People did not see that. Carter tried to tell people about that in his book, The 16th Round. Like a letter in a bottle, he sent it out beyond the prison walls, hoping someone would pick it up. In Canada, Lesra Martin came across the book and received the message. When you came across Reuben Carter's book, what did it say to you? I was at that time battling to, battling a bad image of myself, battling an image that I was stupid, that I couldn't be educated, that I couldn't possibly succeed. Um, and for him to succeed under those circumstances in which he did and to never be broken despite so many years in prison made me realize, you know, well, I can certainly do this. <laughs> 